Good morning. Thank you all for turning out again for this beautiful Williamstown morning. My name is Ryan Ford. I'm a member of the class of 2009 and director of Milestone Reunions. It's great to see so many of you back. This morning, it's really my pleasure to introduce a session on the Williams College Museum of Arts and how art, teaching with art is integrated across the curriculum. Today, you'll have a chance to hear from two colleagues from very different sides of campus about how they work together and how that intersects with the Museum of Art. First, Pam Franks is the class of 1956 director of WICMA. She came to Williams in September 2018. She was previously the senior deputy director at the Yale University Art Gallery. She earned her PhD in the history of art from the University of Texas as, at Austin. And in rereading the announcement of when she was appointed to come to Williams, um, one line that really stood out for me was that throughout her career, she has shown a passionate commitment to the role of the museum in higher education and the inspiration art can bring to all audiences. So I urge you to keep that in mind when she's speaking shortly. Joining her is Dan Bari, uh, Assistant Professor of Computer Science. He's interested in the design and implementation of programming languages, and he his research focuses on new language abstractions, end user programming, and new debugging techniques. This work often blends program analysis with statistical techniques. As a history and poli-sci major, who had some computer science major friends, that means very little to me. Um, but when again, when you think that we're talking about WICMA, um, Dan is a fantastic person to tap into. And so now I'd urge you to join me in welcoming Pam and Dan. Well, thanks so much, Ryan. And it's really wonderful to be here with all of you this morning. Thank you for getting up on this rainy morning. I can't think of a better framing question to start our day, then what does the art museum have to offer computer science? And equally importantly, and I might even say more importantly, what does computer science have to offer the art museum? So keep that kind of framing question in mind. The arts are, of course, a pillar of academic excellence at Williams, and the way that the arts weave through every aspect of the learning experience here, curricularly and co-curricularly, is the driving force as we think about the vision and mission of the museum. So that's big picture. We're gonna dive into a very specific case study about a collaboration between Dan and the museum that really transforms both the way the museum thinks about the collection and hopefully the way that students in the computer programming class to think about the museum. So, so that's what we're gonna do today. I know that many of you have been very interested in what's happening at the museum more generally. We're about halfway through a design process for a new building, so we'll have some little hints at what we're working on now toward that, but this isn't a presentation on the design per se or the new building per se. It's really about the vision for WICMA, the why of the new building. And so I just wanna frame um, the morning a little bit with some of what's going on at WICMA right now, and then turn it over to Dan for a deep dive, and then we'll come back and have a conversation, and we'll have lots of time, I hope, for questions from all of you, because I'm sure you'll have plenty. So remember, what does the art museum offer? Computer science. Also, don't forget, what does computer science <laughs> offer the museum? So as you know, the Williams College Museum of Art has been around for a long time. It's an excellent museum in an excellent college. It's also a small museum in a small college, and the impact is outsized. The impact of this museum is magnitudes bigger than the size of either the museum or the collection or the um, college. Would, uh, would lead you to think. And that's part of what we wanna talk about today. Like how do, what is the, what are the ingredients in the recipe for that impact? So we're approaching our 100th anniversary. The museum was founded in 1926 and it's got a long, strong history and it's continuing to evolve. The last time the museum had an expansion was 1986. At that point, the collection was half the size it is today, and the program focused more specifically on really robust and transformative instruction through the art department. Since that last expansion, the program has expanded across campus. 
We are delighted to be working with some leaders in the architectural field in the design of the exhibition. We're working with the firm Soil. They are based in Brooklyn. The founders are Jing Liu and Florian Eidenberg. Uh, they are deeply immersed in arts architecture and educational architecture. They both teach at the university level. They're very, very interested in how the architectural landscape contributes to the learning experiences and museums are especially of interest to them because they're so immersed in the arts. So they, when we hired them about a year ago, one of the things we're really excited about is they've actually done a museum project for, the, for a university, for UC Davis. Um, it's called the Minetti Shrem Museum. It was finished in 2016. It was the first museum on UC Davis's campus, so quite different from the project for Williams, where we have a really strong, um, a long-standing tradition of the museum. Um, but they're tapped into higher education, both from you know their teaching perspective, but also from this building perspective. Um, I'm also showing you here uh, an art studio, the Amont Foundation in Brooklyn, um, where, which is a, a kind of art space for display and making, but I just love the way that they integrate nature into their spaces. So that's also really important to think about here at Williams, obviously. So um, we'll have little snippets throughout um, my brief introduction that give you a taste of where we're headed with this design, but I just want to say come back to this event next year because as I say, we're halfway through, and at this time next year, we will have our completed designs, and we'll do a full-fledged presentation of where this building is headed and what it's going to look and feel like. Today, we're really focused on what it's going to do and the why of this project. So this is not actually a building yet. It is a, an imagined rendering, a sketch, of what we hope the look and feel will um, start to encompass. It is, uh, you know, this would be the general lobby space of the new museum, some variation of this, emphasizing nature, emphasizing light, very welcoming, drawing people in with art and with light. I want you to just notice a few things. We're thinking about a mass timber construction building. This is really important for sustainability and building the kind of uh, the sustainability into the building in a very visible way is really important for the arts leaders of the future. They will learn what it means to live and work in a museum building that is sustainable while they're at Williams and then they'll take that out into the world with them. The wood is also really warm and welcoming and it gives a kind of um, uh, warmth to the building that will, uh, I think, make people want to come in and then make them want to stay which is super exciting. A few other features, you know, of course, all the views to the outside and the masonry, which is a carbon conscious uh, blend. So really integrating sustainability, art, inspiration, a great work of architecture that is itself a work of art, not just uh, a house for our art is all kind of integral to our vision. Just highlighting again some of the things that Ryan alluded to in his introduction. The arts are a pillar of academic excellence at, at Williams, of course, and thinking about um, how to untap, unlock the, the untapped potential, because there still is some. The arts are all about creating something that didn't exist before. So how does this museum project help us tap into and unlock the potential of the arts? And really what it comes down to is collaborations across the entire campus and all of the intellectual inquiry and exploration that can be brought to bear and stimulated and catalyzed by looking at art. So everything we're doing at the museum every day, our program, our reason for being, our uh, planning for the future museum building is based in teaching and learning with art. So we always come back to the question of how does this thing we're doing or this detail of the new building that we're planning, how does this enhance the possibilities for learning and teaching with art? So this might be a professor speaking in a course, or it might be, as in the slide on your right, an extracurricular activity. This is a philosophy salon that meets in the museum every Thursday afternoon with, with Joe Cruz, a professor in the philosophy department, and it's, it's completely extracurricular. So every Thursday afternoon, students, colleagues, flood into the museum to talk about a philosophical question that's sort of spurred on and inspired by art in the collection. So it's happening both curricularly and co-curricularly 
every day in all kinds of new and exciting ways. Of course, today we're going to focus on curricular connections because I think that is the backbone of the vision. And we've got a really exciting deep dive case study to come soon. I wanted to give you a sense of the big picture. So just in the most recent academic year, so 22, 23, there were 130 different course collaborations that happened at WICMA. And of those, the, many of them met multiple times. So there were 191 class sessions. So any day during the academic year, you come in and you'll see classes in action. But they come from all different departments. Still to this day, the art department is an essential and an incredible partner. We do work with every single art department course, studio and art history at the museum, every faculty member. But we also work with faculty from 27 other departments. And all in all, last year, just in one year, in the context of classes, that added up to over 3,500 student visits to the museum with their classes. So many students are coming more than once. So that is the kind of big picture context of what's happening at WICMA and why it's so important to continue to cultivate this program and support it and move it forward. Um, and because it's just, it's growing every year and it's super exciting. So just to give you a sense of those departments, I mean, 27 different departments, every corner of campus, you can read these lists for yourself. I put art history and studio in bold simply because there's probably in any given year 27 or 30 different classes we work with in that department, but every other department is using the collection and it's growing every year, so super exciting. I just wanted to mention, since we're thinking about a new building, a couple of the spaces where this work happens. Um, a really special space in the museum is the Rose Study Classroom, and it is a seminar room where the professor can select works of art from the collection. They can search the database, they can work with curators, they can choose works that will enhance what they're trying to do in that particular session, and we will bring them out to that seminar room. And then the class meets in the seminar room with the works of art from the collection. And it's a very special experience where the, you know, the kind of discussions around the work of art are very intimate and close up and not kind of um, uh, really uh, mediated by anything. It's very direct and the conversations that ensue are, are equally um, kind of transformative. So one thing I'll say about our Rose Study classroom, it's completely booked. Sometimes we have three or four classes in a day in that classroom. It can be hard to get a session, but it's a really special space. So as we're thinking about the new building, we're keeping that in mind. Everything we're doing now is informing the programming going forward. So I'm showing you here a floor plan that is currently how we're thinking about the new museum space. It's a little hard to read a plan in the abstract, um, so I'll just walk you through it a little bit. All of the teaching and display spaces are on the ground floor of the museum. The entrance is here on the southwest side. This is down here is the, oops, excuse me. Um, down here would be the rotary. So the pathway from campus to the museum is here. And as you come in, there are different pavilions or structures or wings with different functions. The darker pink, the reddish forms are gallery spaces. So we've got ample room to show more of the collection. The lighter pink are the study spaces, like the Rose study room. But you can see we're thinking about having multiple classrooms, perhaps as many as five. The Gold space is an auditorium where we can have lecture classes, but also public programs, um, lectures um, by artists, dance performances. It's very flexible space. The blue is cafe, which is very important to our students. They really, really care about the cafe, and, and we all do. Um, so the way this is going to work is you'll come in, and all of this light blue is covered roof over these different pavilions and wings, and, they're, and it's glass, glass walls. And the idea there is that the connection to the outside world and the beautiful views of nature are available to you betwixt and between all of these different inspiring experiences. So you might be in a classroom 
um, studying a work of art and be all jazzed about that, and you come out and you see nature, and then that you know just enhances the experience. Similarly, between galleries, you might want to sit down and pause and think about what you've seen, talk to a friend, uh, read a little more. So we have seating areas um, where you can sort of settle in and think a little more, have a conversation. Um, so we're really trying to make this a space where um, everyone can sort of make it their own and um, really take, uh, take in what they're seeing and find places to um, relax and kind of take it in and think about it and then study for the next class and so forth. So um, early days again, this is a sketch. Uh, we're just sort of trying to render some of these spaces to think about what they're going to look like and feel like in practice. This is that student lounge area, going back to the plan for just a moment. The study center in the light pink, having a hard time aiming the, um, the printer, but the study center in the light pink, you can see it's sort of circling around a light blue glazed area that looks outside. And that's a student lounge. So that's a place you can come in, you know, gather your thoughts before a class, follow up with your teacher, follow up with a classmate, or just kind of hang out if you have two or three classes in the museum. Um, and it's really specifically for students. So thinking about what that's going to look like, this doesn't necessarily immediately read as museum or formal in any way. We're thinking about having comfortable furniture, but furniture where you can sit and look and read, talk to someone, also views outside. We want this building to be really friendly for all seasons. So you're cozy in here in winter, you're looking out at the beautiful snow, but you're warm and you're waiting to go into those classrooms um, that are all surrounding the student lounge. So again, come back next year, you're gonna see this fully fleshed out, but you're seeing early ideas here now, and it's really about kind of how, how people engage with the museum and how students specifically engage with the museum is informing every part of this project. Now, for today's case study, we're focusing on Object Lab. Object Lab is really our kind of signature program at the museum. You'll remember this big rectangular gallery right as you enter the museum, right on your right. That is our largest gallery and it's going to be dedicated to Object Lab. Object Lab is a hybrid gallery classroom. What do I mean by that? It is open to the public, but it is curated by faculty from across campus in conjunction with their courses. So professors choose works from the collection, we install them, we provide interpretive material that gives a description of the class, and really lets everybody who comes to the museum see how the um, collection is used in teaching across disciplines. So it's been a fantastic program over the last several years. It's continuing to evolve, and as we move forward to the new building, we're thinking about what kinds of spaces, again, like the Rose Study Classroom, Object Lab gets full. So we're really thinking about how to enhance uh, the capacity for these collaborations. Um, and, and it's an exciting prospect to be able to do even more of this work. And it's, it's such a signature part of what we do. So this just happens to be an African dance and, and percussion course. And if you were, if the photo were to continue around the corner, you would see a number of works from our African collection. I should say that the 15,000 works in the Whitman collection span cultures and span history. So we're very lucky to have that range to make all of these curricular connections. Um, and the kind of work that classes are doing is, it, you know, just covers the span. Sometimes it's writing, sometimes it's, it's presenting, sometimes it's performing, sometimes it's programming. So again, thinking about what Object Lab will look like. This is another sketch, thinking what does, what do the gallery spaces look like, what role does light play, what role does wood play, but most importantly, how do people engage with art in these spaces? And with that, I'll turn it over to Dan for the deep dive into how the museum is participating, collaborating with principles of programming languages. Um, <clears throat> so this is, a, this is a, a real pleasure to be able to speak in front of you um, to talk about my experience with uh, WICMA. I've been collaborating with them now for a few years, actually. Um, so the course is a course called Principles of Programming Languages. It's an upper-level course. It's a required course in computer science. 
Um, so I'm, we're, you know, in the computer science program, we are, we are forcing everybody to go to the museum, <laughs> which is maybe a little unusual for, for, a, um, for a computer science course, but I want to talk about the rationale and why uh, working with Wikima is such a uh, privilege. Um, okay, so uh, here's a picture of the object lab um, from, I think this was from last semester, last time I taught this course. I didn't have a chance to go and take new pictures. But the idea is that I've, I've worked with one of the curators uh, at the museum, uh, Liz Gallerani, to choose some artworks uh, that we sort of focus our attention on throughout the semester. Um, so here's, here's what it looked like last semester. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. So uh, I, uh, I am a computer scientist. Um, uh, as Ryan mentioned, I focus on the design and implementation of programming languages. Um, and that is essentially what the course is about, is sort of my specialty, designing tools in order to do computational things. Um, so the course really focuses on this question, how do we design um, software so that we can enable people, and, and when I say people, I don't mean just programmers, I mean everybody, to fully exploit the capabilities of computers. Um, and here's a little video I wanted to show you. Uh, you might recognize this guy. This is sort of an early uh, uh, video of Steve Jobs. And I want to show you this video because for me, his message that he talks about really resonates. And for me, it sort of forms the core of why I think this is an interesting subject. So I'm just going to quickly play this video. Scientific American, I think it was, did a study in the early 70s on the efficiency of locomotion. And that's what they did was for all different species of things on the planet, birds and cats and dogs and fish and man and goats and stuff, they measured how much energy does it take for a goat to get from here to there, right? Kilocalories per kilometer or something, I don't know what they measured it in. And they ranked them, they published a list, and, and the condor won. The condor took the least amount of energy to get from here to there. And man was, didn't do so well, came in with a rather unimpressive showing about a third of the way down the list. But fortunately, someone at Scientific American was insightful enough to test man with a bicycle. And man with a bicycle won, twice as good as the condor, all the way off the list. And what it showed was that man as a tool maker has the ability to make a tool to amplify an inherent ability that he has. And that's exactly what we're doing here. It's exactly what we're doing here. So, you know, th this message really <coughs> resonated with me. <clears throat> excuse me, in a, in a really big way when I was kind of getting my start in computer science. Um, and the analogy he, he uses all the time is this idea of a bicycle for the mind. So bicycles make humans more efficient at locomotion. And so a computer in some sense is like a bicycle for the mind. It makes us more efficient at thinking, right? It aids us in thinking. Um, so here's a fun little fact about computers. Right, so we have a computer maybe from the early Steve Jobs era, right? This is the, the first Macintosh. Uh, so this is kind of circa 1983, 1984. And then we have a modern computer on the right. And the surprising fact that sort of animates the whole conversation of the class is the fact that these two machines have exactly the same computational power. What that means is they are capable of exactly the same kinds of things. So in principle, the machine on the left can do all the same things that the machine on the right can do. Clearly, the machine on the right is uh, maybe a little bit cheaper. It's, um, it's prettier, right? It has a nice display. And it's certainly easier to use. But the reason why has less to do with the computer and more to do with the fact that programming languages are better now. Programming languages are the primary reason why we're able to build these kind of rich, immersive uh, computational experiences that just about everybody can use. You might remember that the machine on the left really, in some ways, wasn't for everybody, right? The goal was to make it for everybody, but we have now moved to the point where everybody does actually carry a little computer with them, just about, right? So, I'm gonna give you a little bit of computer science. So you're gonna get this course in a nutshell, right? So it's, it's gonna be fast, right? We only have about 15 to 20 minutes to, to give you a whole semester of computer science, but let me give you a, a sense of what a computer does on the inside. So a computer is capable of simple operations, very simple operations. And inside of it, it has a table of all these operations, what it can do. Things like add and subtract and multiply and a whole variety of operations like that. Now, the surprising fact about computers, when I say they're computationally, uh, they have the same capabilities, this table of operations basically has not changed 
since the beginning of computation, right? We figured this table out basically in the 1950s, and it has essentially not changed. So the trick that every budding programmer has to learn is how to do complicated things with incredibly simple steps. Um, and let me give you kind of an analogy. So anyone here ever make a cake before? I'm gonna get a show of hands, people who have made a cake before. So hopefully a few of you, right? Okay, so um, recipes are not unlike computer programs in many ways, they're procedures, right? So imagine if your cake recipe looked a bit like this. So here's our recipe for a cake. Start by facing your countertop. <laughs> Turn, right? Walk five paces. Turn 90 degrees. Open your cabinet. Take your flour out. Take your sugar out. Take your oil out. You think I'm kidding, right? But this is, this is, uh, this is a good analogy, right? So take your vanilla out, turn your 90 degrees, and you know, so on and so forth, right, for a long time, right? And so far, all we've, all we've done so far, right, we, is we've, we've taken the ingredients out and put them on the counter. Now we have to go back and get our bowl and our spoon, right? And, and, and all of this, we have to, in excruciating detail, right? This is exactly what it's like to talk to the computer in its native language, okay? So clearly not, this is not sort of intuitive for people in any way. And when people say that computer programming hard, is hard, this is what they mean, they're talking about this. So this is uh, let's, maybe, maybe some appropriate art, right? Okay. So um, here's a much better recipe. And, and if you've actually baked a cake, you've seen something a bit more like this, right? Which is go get the ingredients, right? And then put them together in certain ways. And, you know, heat your oven and put it in, right? And, and this is essentially the recipe, right? Um, and why is this a better recipe? Well, it amplifies our abilities. It does not give us every single detail. It just gives us what we need in order to get the thing done. In fact, it sort of meets us halfway. It's precise enough, right? Um, and it actually doesn't say precisely what to do. Uh, over, over the years, recipes have gotten more and more precise in some ways, but there's always this balance of giving you enough information so that you can do it without bogging you down with all the detail. Okay, so because students have to, when they're learning how to program a computer for the very first time, this is an incredibly complicated task. We start with the kind of conceptually most simple task you could possibly do, which is just getting the computer to say hello to you. And colloquially, in computer science, we refer to this as the Hello World program. So this is the first program every student writes. Now, this is how you actually tell the computer to do it, right? This is kind of like that really horrible recipe where we've spelled out every single step. It's like, we have to take this number, we have to put it in this register, we have to left shift it some amount, we have to copy it to some other register. It's like this horrible, very detailed, machine-specific thing. But what we actually teach students the first time is this kind of program. And if, if you're sitting in the audience right now and, you, and you've never seen a computer program before, right, or you, you have no experience computer programming, I bet to a first approximation you can look at this program and you can sort of see what it's doing, right? It says, print, hello world, right? And yeah, there's some other stuff around there and we spend some time talking about that in the, in the class, why those things are necessary. But notice the distinction here is that this is much more like that good recipe in the sense that it gives you enough precision to get the job done but it doesn't bog you down in the detail. And that is essentially what a programming language does. It allows us to translate between the way we need to speak to the computer, the way that we prefer to speak to the computer, and the way we actually have to speak to the computer. Okay, so this course is really about how do we design and build those things, right? How do we design them so they can amplify our abilities? Okay, so now it's, it's pretty easy to make a computer do the very sort of logical Spock-like things. Right, which is why I think for the early years of computer science, that's what computers were sort of mostly uh, doing. Right, this is what we employed them for. Um, you know, uh, financial sort of things, scientific sort of things, mathematical sort of things. But you've probably seen that over the years we have been able to move computers into much more interesting, intuitive things. And getting a computer to do interesting, intuitive things, it's much harder, but it's also much more impactful. If we can get artists, right, so this is Jackson Pollock, if we could get artists to be able to do the kind of free, expressive things that they could ordinarily do with, like, paint, but on a computer, isn't that a much better computer? I, I, I argue it, it is, and, and this is kind of what I, the, the big idea that I want students to think about as they start working with this class. 
Okay, so, you know, computers, uh, hopefully you've, you're sort of convinced that we can do some genuinely astonishing things with them. Uh, maybe you followed a little bit about the artificial intelligence kind of gains that we've had over the past couple of years. Um, I argue that good programming languages are a key contributor to the, that kind of change, the, the kind of amazing achievements we've seen with computers. Okay, so coming back to why I, I'm working with, with Wicma, no one really has, you know, I, I'm clearly animated by this myself, but few students actually have a burning desire to build programming languages, right? Um, in fact, it's a core requirement for the major. So, like, there's a bunch of people who are really almost dragged kicking and screaming into this class. Um, so, how do, I, how do I get them to be excited about this problem? And the thought that I had was, well, what makes me think this is interesting? There's obviously this sort of good to humanity, but actually the thing that really drives me is the fact that I just think the program on the right is more beautiful than the one on the left. And um, so you might think that's a little strange, like beauty, is that an important part of computer science and mathematics? And the answer is yes. And let me give you an interesting fact. So roughly half of all mathematics publications are new proofs for things we already know to be true, right? We've already proved these things. These are new proofs for proofs we already have. And you might think, oh man, that is a huge waste of my money. The national, I'm giving my hard-earned tax money to the National Science Foundation to, to learn proofs we already know. Well, actually, this isn't quite true. What you're giving them money for, that 50%, is for beautiful proofs. And this matters because it helps us understand our world in, in a better way. It's much more intuitive. It matches the way we think. So really, this is where Wicoma comes in. Um, I... Uh, I'll tell you a little story about, you know, how I th sort of thought of the... I, I, I honestly should give Wicma as much credit as me for having this idea because I sort of blundered my way into this uh, collaboration. Um, but I came to Wicma because I wanted them to help me with this question of how do I motivate students to think about the combination of computer science and sort of aesthetics. So I was sort of walking across campus one day, and you may have, might have seen uh, a sculpture like this on campus. This is the sister sculpture um, to the one we have on campus. Um, it's called Double L Eccentric Gyratory. Uh, the one on campus is called Two. This is Three. This is as, as at Namkeg, which is uh, about 30 miles south of here. Um, and I sort of love looking at it, right? I was just thinking about this problem one day, walking across campus, and I kind of stopped in front of this thing, and I was sort of staring at it thinking about how do I, how do I blend this, this idea of aesthetics and sort of technical know-how, and looking at this, I suddenly realized, oh, actually, this sculpture does exactly that thing, right? It is a blend of technical know-how and um, sort of aesthetics, right? And if you need any more evidence that this is uh, potentially of interest to, William, to students at Williams, this kind of blend of aesthetics and, or aesthetics in general, right? Um, we have this program called Walls on campus, which is uh, Williams Art Loan for Living Spaces, where students can borrow an artwork from Wicma and put it in their dorm room for the semester, which is just so cool. And also, I, I'm amazed how trustful you are of students <laughs> to, to actually do that. Um, and in fact, um, if, you, if you're wondering, like, is aesthetics a popular thing on campus, the answer is, well, two of the top 10 most popular majors on campus, art, and uh, English literature, right? Uh, like those are incredibly popular majors. So, so this is, my thinking here was, maybe this is some way that I can blend these two, but also get students really interested, right? Students are clearly interested in this kind of thing. Maybe I can get them interested in my problems if I, if I kind of approach it this way. So coming back to the sculpture, you know, one of the things that kind of amazed me as I was staring at this thing was the fact that, um, you know, depressingly few students are chopped in half by this as it flails around in the wind, right? These are effectively helicopter blades, right? And why is that? Well, it's, uh, it's because it's well engineered, right? Um, and in fact, let me tell you a little bit about the history of this sculpture. So it was invented by, it was created by this guy named George Rigge. Um, he was actually a, prior to World War II, he was sort of a, uh, he'd worked mostly on drawing, um, and he was drafted in, into the war effort. And when, what he did while he was working on the war effort was he designed machine gun turrets, right? So totally different from his training, which was as an artist. Um, but what he learned while he was working on this problem was sort of the mechanical foundations of building machines. And 
So effectively, he was an engineer. And so when he finished the war, he had this idea of maybe I can take this sort of engineer's training that I have and turn it into uh, some kind of artwork. And so he's sort of well known for these delicately, delicately balanced wind activated kinetic sculptures. Um, there was actually an exhibit at Namkeg, uh, I want to say it was last year or the year before, where they had a ton of his sculptures. We have one here on campus, but they're beautiful. You should go take a look at it if it stops raining while, while you're here. Um, and so, you know, the first question, I, so I thought, oh, this is a great idea. I should totally do this. Uh, the next question for me was, will my department be okay with me doing this? Because this is definitely a departure from the way we normally do things in the computer science department. Um, fortunately, I have a very open-minded open um, department. Um, but actually, if you look at the course description, right, it says that the course is about the concepts and structures governing the design and implementation of programming languages. Now, in computer science, we often focus a lot on the implementation, like how do you actually build things, right? Sort of the engineer's perspective. But I argue that the design part is at least as important, right? And design really is about what do we want this thing to do if one of the things we want it to do is to not just be useful, but sort of pleasing, right? To be, you know, enjoyable in some ways. Well, that's a subject, I think, an, an appropriate subject of study for the course. So that's essentially what WICMA has, has been able to help me do. Okay, so how did this thing finally come about? Well, I, saw, I emailed um, WICMA and I said, can you tell me, but I had no, no idea what this thing was. I said, can you tell me about this thing? And I got a response uh, and they said, yeah, we can tell you lots. I've CC'd my intern. Um, she'll dig up some stuff. The intern uh, gave me a whole bunch of history on it, which was great. And then, this was not something I expected. Liz Gallerani from the, the, um, from the museum said, you can of course limit yourself to that sculpture, but if you're interested, we could just move the class into WICMA and we could do it here and we could, we could we could curate a whole selection of things, and I went, wow, that, that's amazing. I had no idea that we could do that. So I, I definitely said yes. So our first day of class, we actually start at WICMA, and we start with this activity where students come and they look at this. This is a Solowit, um, and this is right on the wall, right in the entrance of WICMA, and we ask them, what do you see? And this activity is as much about uh, seeing things as sort of unseeing things, right? Because students, you know, they're in an art gallery, their first thought is to say something that sounds very like art critic-y. And so part of this activity is just getting them to appreciate the distinction between describing something and interpreting something. And which is a major theme, I think, in, in many of the art courses. Um, and so this is a, sort of a weird way of introducing this, and computer science students maybe will never sort of get this message, but um, it, outside, outside of an art museum. But it, it, it matters because uh, we really want them to think about how this artwork is sort of put together in some ways. And uh, it's really funny when we do this activity because after the students, we get them to finally tell us things like, yeah, there's red in this painting, and there's like blue in the painting. Liz has to finally shout out, isn't it big, <laughs> right? Which is sort of funny because it's, it's so, it's blindingly obvious that it's big, but it's one of these things that students sort of miss at first. As the semester progresses, we switch over to asking this other question, which was how could you get a computer to draw this? Um, and now they really do have to think about uh, an artwork as a sequence of small steps which is exactly the way we think about computer programming. So we're sort of bridging this kind of creative thing with the same idea. And the reason why this works is that, although it may seem like computer science is about computers, the machines, really, computer science is the mathematics of processes, right? And so artists use a process, and their process is very similar to the process we use when we make programs. So I really want to kind of draw that out of students and, and get them to kind of see that. And, and for students who had who'd never, you know, maybe they're taking computer science because mom and dad told them it was a good job, right? But their, their hearts are with art. This is actually a way of kind of uh, reaching out to those students. Um, so the first big activity that we do, and this is actually what we're going to be doing in this coming week in, in the class, is we start, so we have to do a sort of bunch of preliminary sort of uh, what the students call eating your vegetables stuff where they learn a bunch of kind of math, math and science kinds of things. But then we start with this and we say, okay, can we get a computer to draw this now? And this is a, an artwork, it's called uh, Homage to the Square Warming. It's by uh, Josef Albers. Um, I always ask that this one is in the uh, object lab. There's actually a series of these, and it, it's deceptively simple, right? It's like just a bunch of squares, right? So to a first approximation, it's like four squares, 
maybe going from gray to sort of an orangey color, stacked, uh, where they're sort of getting a bit smaller as, you, as they kind of go up, right? Um, so what's the first step if we want to ask a computer to do this? Maybe draw the gray square, right, the one at the bottom, and then maybe somehow draw the next one on top of it, right? So I want students to think about, like, how might you construct this, right? And maybe the way the computer constructs it isn't exactly the same way as an artist constructs it, but we, the goal is to construct something that looks similar in the end. Now, I just want to point out, programming is not for the faint of heart, <laughs> um, but I, we're going to write a program together. Um, and the key thing to keep in mind is that computers, they just have no tolerance for imprecision whatsoever. Right, so uh, here we go. Um, let me tell you a little bit about how things are drawn on screen. So on a computer, we have basically a big grid of pixels. Um, they are now, the pixels are so small that they're sort of hard to see, um, but that's essentially what we have. And what we can do is we can tell the computer, you know, um, we, have, we basically set up this coordinate system. So this is our x-axis, uh, this is our y-axis here. Uh, zero, unusually in computer science, so it was on the top left instead of the bottom, uh, the bottom left in case you're a, sort of a mathy person. But the point is we can specify exactly where we're going to put something on the screen by saying what its coordinates are. Okay? So for example, if we want to draw a red pixel, we just say at coordinate 5.3, here, put a red thing. And if we want to put like a green pixel at, you know, next to it, right, and so on and so forth, we just have to say what the coordinates are and then we can put it there. Now obviously we want to build, we want to draw more complicated things than just single dots on the screen. And so we have a way of combining those into more complicated things like rectangles and circles and triangles. But we start with these sort of very primitive things and we build them up, right? And in a way, this is kind of building the vocabulary of the computer. That is what computer programming is, is all about. So, okay, how do we draw one of those rectangles? Let's draw this artwork now. Well, we have to say something about a rectangle and we have to say sort of where it is and how big it is. So let's start by putting our first rectangle, uh, in fact, it's going to be a square, uh, at these coordinates. And then we'll say that it's about this big, right? Um, so it has a width and a height of basically the size of the screen. Um, and then we have to give it a color. And uh, don't worry about too much about the, exactly how this works, but this is the kind of computer's way of saying that there's a color in there. Um, now, when we do that, we end up with something that looks a little bit like this. Uh, notice I was supposed to draw gray and I was a little bit off, but eh, gray and black are close enough, right? I'm not an artist, I want to point out. Uh, but we can go back and refine this later. So we have our first square. What do we do next? Well, we're going to take that same idea, right, of kind of drawing a square, and we're going to change a little bit. We want the next square to be a little bit inset from the first one, and we want it to be a little bit smaller. We want it to have a different color. So let's change those things. Let's, let's kind of bump it in a little bit, bump it down a little bit, make it a little bit smaller, change its color. And if you're wondering, have I memorized all the colors on the computer? Not really. I just looked them up in a table somewhere. Okay? So then let's draw that one, and we end up with something that looks a little bit like this. right? So you can see that it's getting closer. It's still not quite the right color, but you know, I'm, again, I'm not an artist. Um, but we're going to keep doing this process, right? So here's another square, right? We're going to sort of make it a little bit smaller. We're going to change its color a little bit, right? And we're going to keep doing this until we get something that's sort of approximating. And if the lights were a little bit dimmer, you could maybe see this a little bit better. But, right, we're sort of approximating the thing that we wanted, right? So how do we do? Here's the actual artwork. Well, uh, it's not terrible, but it, <laughs> It's not bad, right? And you can see, essentially, what the process was for building this thing, right? OK. Now, the thing is, of course, if you go and you look at the actual artwork, you kind of zoom in on the detail, uh, you might notice that we omitted some detail, right? We, we actually failed to reproduce some, I think, that are sort of pleasing parts of this artwork. Um, so the, notice the original painting squares are a bit imprecise. Um, but here's the fun part about this activity, is that students can follow uh, they can go down the rabbit hole as far as they want, trying to reproduce this artwork. And the thing is, they have to now define what it means to be sort of imprecise in a precise way, because that's how the computer speaks. So I love this idea. I had students who spent an entire two weeks of the semester just figuring out how to make things look like sort of wavy brush strokes, which was super cool. And they did a beautiful job. Um, OK, so here's the next part, right? It's not just about drawing and reproducing what we're, what we're looking at. How do we make it so that it's easy for normal humans? How do we make it so we could actually take that description that we had originally and produce an artwork that looks like this? Um, 
So that is what a programming language is. And the way we want to think about a programming language, it, the way I pitch it in my course is, think of a programming language as a machine. It takes in a description, and what it spits out at the end is hopefully that little program that generates the artwork, right, that we were looking at before. Um, this is maybe a little hard to see, and there's a ton of stuff here, but like the code that they have to write ends up looking a bit like this. There's a ton of it, by the way. This is only a tiny little snippet of it. But once they get it done, what the, one of the things they can do is they can run it this way. So here's just a, a video of me using this programming language that we just designed, where I say how big I want it to be, and I, say, I use that description, right? And this false thing just means debugging output. And you can see it's the program that we worked on together just a minute ago, okay? Um, here I'm redirecting it to a file just so I can look at it. And so I go and I open it on the right-hand side here, and you can see it sort of looks like what we want. Now, for, for added flavor, um, you can run this program again, and I added a little bit of randomness to the program. You can think of this as the program is interpreting what the output uh, looks like. It's sort of taking uh, you know, some, uh, some liberties with my description, and it's giving me variations on this artwork. And so this is a fun way of exploring uh, you know, what, what is the artwork really about? How do we get a computer to do it? Um, okay, so sort of wrapping up here, students can choose any of the artworks from the object lab to do this activity with. We start with this uh, Yosef Albers one on, on the left, but they can pick kind of any of the artworks that we have. And we try to pick artworks that are like plausible. Um, so in fact, the splatter painting one in the middle here is probably one of the harder ones to do because it's really hard to actually get a computer to draw that way. But, but it's a fun ex uh, uh, exercise to do that. So in summary, I think Wikma is an amazing resource, right? I would not be able to, to do this without access um, to the, to the um, galleries and, and more importantly, access to the people who work at Wikma who helped me develop this kind of curriculum. Um, and I really think it's a great way of connecting with your students. Um, anecdotally, my end of semester course evaluations dramatically improved when I started doing this, um, which, you know, uh, that's the main goal for me, right? Um, but actually, you know, in addition to bringing sort of art people to computer science, I actually think hopefully it goes the other way around too and we're kind of bringing geeks to the art world. So um, thank you so much for your attention. Um, I think we're going to speak now. Yeah. Switch this. To the Dan, that was great. So inspiring to me. I, you've articulated through this um, discussion of how you engage with Wegman in your course. So you've articulated the, my hopes and dreams for Wigma in such an incredible <laughs> way. I really, I want Wigma to be a bicycle to amplify the power of the liberal arts. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that kind of analogy that you draw out and, and the work that you're doing with your students really shows how that's possible. And, and you've talked about it a lot today, so it's not really a question, <laughs> but it's an important thing to yeah. keep in mind. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, you know, one thing I should, I should say is that um, when I was looking, you know, when, after I got my PhD, there were lots of options for computer scientists. Um, one of the things I, I really wanted to do was, um, I didn't just want to do research, which was what my training was in, but I really felt an obligation to teach. I felt like strongly that that was important. And in case you don't know how, to, how, um, how higher education works at research universities, uh, if you go to a big research university, what's called an R1, um, your primary job as a researcher, as a, as a professor there is to research. And the teaching part is just an obligation you must dispense, right? Like it's something you have to do. Um, and as long as you're not like hurting the students, it's fine, right? <laughs> and, and, you know, I, ha I had that, I went to a big research university and uh, I just kept thinking I could do this so much better. Um, and I really felt strongly that I wanted to do something better. So when I applied for jobs, um, Williams was my top choice. Um, and I, I'm incredibly lucky that I, I was able to come here. And my fantasy really was, can I do these kind of wacky things, right, where I get to go into an art museum and teach a computer science course. And, you know, I have another course that I'm teaching right now. And, and my, my fantasy was to teach it like in like a lounge area where we have tea and cookies and stuff. And that's how I teach my computer security course, right? And Williams makes it possible for me to do that. In fact, they, they give me money to do that, which is just incredible, right? So no, I, love, I love the fact that we have this resource here. And it, it really is a lot of fun. That's great. Um, 
I think we should just open it right up to questions. I'm sure you have some. There's um, colleagues out in, uh, in the aisles with microphones, so please wait until you have a mic to ask your question. I see a few. Uh, thank you both. <laughs> a quick question. At the, in the um, computer art piece, at the end, is it just a piece of computer art, or what you didn't show us is the program becomes beautiful? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I, I do emphasize the beauty of the program. I didn't show too much of that to you. But yes, actually, this is a major theme of the course. Um, the programming language that we chose to write this in is something that most students are not uh, exposed to. It's a, a language called ML. And ML was specifically designed to make programming pleasant, um, which is a little bit weird. Now, it has very strong mathematical foundations, and that's part of, part of its beauty in a way. It, and it's actually part of the challenge for students is to think about uh, this programs in kind of a mathematical way. But yeah, at the end of the day, uh, when you're done, it looks nice. And one of the things that students often say to me is they say, you know, the nice looking programs usually are better, right? Like they have fewer bugs. And I, I, lo I love that idea that that's actually what emerges from, from this class. So, so yeah, I think uh, beauty is not just the thing that we make, but um, you know, the, the output of the program, but the program itself. One, one thing that strikes me that I might just add at this juncture is um, one of the joys of um, spending time with art and one of the things that really that I learned in a more traditional art historical education is that a work of art reveals itself over time and you see things the time when you come back to a work of art that you didn't see before and it continues to, um, to engage you in ways that evolve and change. And one of the things that I find really interesting about the way you're describing the, your, your students in the course and their engagement with the collection is the precision and the attention that they need to spend looking at the art. So this was a skill that I learned through art historical training, and, and many of us did, but it's really happening yeah. in your course that they're looking much yeah. more closely than they would if they were visiting the museum on their own or yeah. in some other context. Yeah, it, it's really wonderful too. And, and you know, if I did not have WICMA, um, the way I would approach this would be to show them sort of pictures of art. But you know, there's something really important that's kind of lost in translation, I, I would argue. And so students being able to get up really up close to the actual artworks themselves, like they can get inches away from it if they want to, I think is a real uh, benefit. Yeah. Hi. Um, as a veteran of the 80 column punch card, uh, <laughs> which you probably never even saw, um, I have a collection. Uh, this, this really excited me. I uh, wish I was a freshman. <laughs> um, how do you deal with the precision that coding takes? Because what my experience was, I always forgot the comma or the parent. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, so this is, I, I would argue, sort of the main struggle that students have in computer science. Um, you know, you can sort of contrast it with the math example, right? So in a math course, you know, you're often asked to prove something. And there's some degree of precision that's important there. But usually the professor can look at sort of what you wrote and get the gist of it and say, yeah, maybe you missed a step here or you didn't quite say this the right way. But I'm going to give you partial credit, right? And, that, and that's great. And your experience, I, I think, as you know, uh, nothing less than perfection <laughs> will work at, at all. The computer will just refuse to do what you say. And, and yeah, it's, really, it's, a really, it's a real struggle with students um, to, to get them to um, not just appreciate that, but to be able to work through that. And so um, you probably know that um, computer science students probably spend more time in the lab <laughs> than, than many other scientists. They kind of, in fact, our, our labs in the computer science building are open um, uh, 24 hours a day uh, because the students are often there in the middle of the night. And it's a challenge and the, really what we end up uh, hopefully impressing on them over time is that um, paying attention to the detail and getting it right is actually really essential uh, to, to making computers work. Now, I hope that in the future, I mean, this is part of my research, that we can move away from having to com communicate with computers in this way, but it really actually hasn't, although we're not using punch cards anymore, we, it really has the, the kind of essential task of noticing tiny details and maybe you left out one character and the program doesn't work. That, unfortunately, has not changed so far? Yeah, great question. I, my question is more of a kind of thank you and a warning. 
Um, my late husband was one of the early programmers at IBM and then ended up as uh, head of the UMass computer science uh, thing. So we had computers around forever. But I am also a writer who recently, without being asked, had many of my books and stories and poems taken by AI and they're going to use them and reuse them without permission or payment. And I think we need to find some way when we're busy making better machines and better programmers to find a way to, to, to talk about um, what we mean when we're saying, are we borrowing? Are we reselling? Are we re changing the artist's vision? Um, and I, I find that um, an interesting but painful uh, thing to con have to contemplate. Yeah, I mean, this, this is a great observation. Um, you know, I, one of the things I think that um, the computational way of thinking can, can bring is maybe a little bit more clarity on problems that we have not really had to address quite so directly in the past. So I'll, I'll give you an analogy to this, and then I'll kind of return to your, your main point, which is, you know, we are, we are in the process of developing machines that can drive cars, right? And uh, if you've taken a philosophy course, you might be familiar with the trolley problem, right? Which has always seemed like such like a hypothetical, like this is silly, right? That in case you're not familiar with the problem, it's like there's this out of control train trolley going down the tracks and on one track there's like a group of people and then off on the side there's another group of people and you have the ability to you know switch the train to either go down the main tracks and kill a large group of people or switch it to this other one and kill a small group of people and how do you make this decision and philosophers love this question right um, and it's, it's always interesting as a student to by the way I, I was a philosophy major in college not a computer science major um, uh, and, and it was, you know, sort of fun in the abstract to sort of think about these ideas, but now we actually have to solve these problems, right? And when it comes to AI, I think, you know, the, the, the chat GPT is sort of a good example of what you're talking about, which sort of appropriates things on the web. Um, you know, we, I don't think we really, we did not grapple appropriately with that before, before we did it. Um, uh, and, and more importantly, I think there is a distinction between what we are capable of doing and what we should do, right? And, um, you know, I think the tradition in computer science has always been to build it if you can. And now we really do actually need to think carefully about whether it's a good idea, right? Is it serving our aims as a society? And we have to sort of decide what, what are our aims as a society? So, you know, we in computer science, um, we're worried about this. We, all of us, I think, sort of feel like it's not necessarily our within our skill set, but we have been talking, we're actually actively in the middle of a curricular discussion now about how we change the computer science program to embed things like ethics um, in, in the course. And this is tough, right? We're not experts in ethics either. Uh, I have some philosophy training, but like, I think we're gonna have to turn to our colleagues in other departments and ask, you know, um, have a big conversation. What do we really want to get out of these things? Because now we are finally able to do things that we, th we thought before we couldn't do, um, and maybe we shouldn't do. <laughs> Another um, great, uh, uh, sort of uh, supporting um, point for teaching across disciplines and thinking about the connections and so forth. I think we all think a lot about how do you teach creativity and how do you cultivate a creative mindset and, uh, and a kind of um, uh, a sort of openness to innovation and, and an adventurous spirit toward this. I do think another part of this that can come through this collaborative teaching is how do you uh, work with students in thinking about how to value creativity. So how to be creative, but also how to value creativity and how to understand the ethics yeah. around creation and all of the responsibility that comes with it. Yeah. So I really thank you for your point and for your answer because I think um, it's a complex enterprise that we're involved in when we come together in these ways. Yeah, certainly. Ooh, me. Um, when I took programming here at Williams in the early 70s, we learned machine language, and then we progressed all the way to basic and Fortran. Mm -hmm. Very different languages. Yeah. But looking at your cake recipe and some of the things you said, beautiful program goes from 
complex to non-complex. Uh -huh. Goes from long to short. Yeah. Art, you look at it, but you go back and look at it again, becomes increasingly complex. So these things are going in opposite directions. <laughs> in some ways, yeah. <laughs> Interesting observation, yeah. Um, I mean, the, if, if you want to spend some time and explore the complexity of of you know the computer program part, so I, I I do like the simpler ones, but nothing is stopping you from from going and it, you know it's it's like being in a car, right? Cars cars are simpler in many ways now than they were before, right? You have a steering wheel and you have like you now have one pedal or two pedals, right? Actually, I have one pedal driving on my car. I rarely use the brake pedal, which seems kind of crazy, um, <laughs> right? But, but, but Seriously, uh, but you know, the, the complexity inside that car is vastly more than it was with sort of the earlier cars, but the interface is simpler. And so you're right, and, and I, I do actually think that programs do have that, um, do have that quality where the more you stare at them and the more you ask how they work, the deeper you can go and the more you can learn. And um, we barely have enough time at Williams to cover sort of the rudiments <laughs> of good programming, um, but you can, you can Go as far down the rabbit hole as you want. Um, so I, I do actually think they're more similar than, than you say, but, but it's true. I, uh, I do want the programs to be on their face simple. Yeah. I also think in terms of sort of um, the, the spectrum from simplicity to complexity and complexity to simplicity, sometimes, I, I, you know, as I said before, I love how uh, sort of deep engagement with art continues to uh, provide an ongoing unfolding meaning in ways that are unexpected and that's more and more complex. I also do think, I was, I was thinking about this when you talked about the, the kind of um, uh, beautiful proofs that are proving something we already know. Many times a really powerful work of art is making clear for us something we already know, but it's sort of saying it in such a, a way that just makes it so apparent and so powerful. So I think, I think going both directions is part of that kind of mental and intellectual and aesthetic nimbleness oh, yeah. that's so I, yeah. powerful. I completely agree. Yeah, totally. Could you give us a couple of other examples of different courses um, that use the museum, uh, maybe a political science course or uh, economics, you know, something uh, in the humanities that, um, that would, would illuminate this point. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think um, uh, just kind of still in the math, computer science vein, multivariable calculus has been a really important partner for us, thinking about how um, it, we understand shape and, and analyze it and so forth. I do think the kind of, I just, maybe I'll circle to environmental studies because they become a very, very important partner for us and it actually ties into the museum design as well. So the idea that um, the way that uh, these courses engage with the collection can kind of think about sustainability on every level. And one example is how um, some artists, some contemporary artists today, are actually incorporating into their creative practice a, uh, a metric for how much, so what the carbon footprint of their creative practice is, and making that part of the acquisition price. So um, one example recently is a work by Alison Janae Hamilton, a, an artist who is, is um, sort of mid-career, really super, uh, super powerful artist, and, and was brought to us in our collection by students who, and so this is the other example of a, a course that is a really important part of our program. They were brought to us, Alison Janae Hamilton, and to the collection through a course on acquiring art that's co-taught by a curator and an economics professor thinking about what um, the various vectors of, of analysis are in deciding to acquire a work of art for a museum. So we go through the um, collecting priorities of the museum. We talk about the strategic plan and the educational mission. And then Steve Shepard from economics talks about price modeling and the art market as an example of how you think about uh, what, what a good um, uh, way of thinking about uh, an appropriate cost for something is. And 
the students bring it all together and propose acquisitions for the museum, and then the best of those acquisitions that are convincing to our acquisitions committee are acquired by the museum, and then they go on view alongside the acquisitions that we make as a curatorial team, become a central part of our, our, um, our interpretive program and the, the art that we're presenting. But it's, it's very much, you know, students from both art history and economics coming together to, to um, kind of engage with the museum in that way. So there's many, many more, as I say, 130 classes last year um, from every discipline. And um, I'll just highlight another a sort of more art historical case because it's interesting thinking about uh, medieval art history. There was a course on medieval art history and the students wrote academic papers based on objects from the collection, as you would expect. But then they also decided to do a symposium presenting that work in the context of a medieval feast. So they curated a medieval feast with the entire menu and presented those papers. So I mean, the, the ideas are just unlimited and the creativity is, is, is so inspiring. I guess that's me. Would would you, Pam, would you exhibit uh, a piece that was created by a beautiful program uh, and call that art? It's a great question, and I think it's exactly the kind of question that we're going to be grappling with together and thinking about where that fits, and it relates to some of the earlier comments, too. One thing that we're very excited about doing, though, is actually showing the process of this engagement from all different points of view and making sure that, that we're sharing what we're learning through these conversations across different disciplines and different lines of inquiry and, and just showing the richness of that possibility. So that's not an answer. I, I acknowledge it's not an answer, but it's, it is, it's something that we're going to be continuing to think about together. Yeah, love it. I'm in favor. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, thank you.